Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Edwards. Good morning. Glad to welcome each one of you to our worship on this uh, bright Sunday, the first in, of uh, Sunday in September. We're so glad that you've chosen to come and be with us today. Uh, those of you that are present, we're also uh, glad to welcome those of you who are visiting with us by means of radio or the internet in some form or fashion. We uh, certainly trust that you will be blessed as we worship together in these next moments. Just a couple of announcements that I would remind you of. Uh, they're both there in your bulletin. Uh, just a, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, deacon group will have their uh, meeting next Sunday at 9 o'clock there in the parlor. Uh, particularly for those that are our newly elected deacons uh, to uh, get you in uh, the, the practice of that uh, second Sunday of, of each month. Uh, also, we will be having a uh, baby dedication on the 19th of September during our regular service, and we invite you to put that on your calendar so you can come and be a part of that very special time as well. Uh, I understand as well that the uh, uh, association is looking for a couple of more homemade cakes uh, to uh, help out with their uh, golf tournament for the uh, toy store. Uh, if you're interested in that, you can contact Teresa and uh, she can give you all the information that you need uh, for that. Now, let's begin with our worship today with our uh, scripture from Psalm 125. Psalm 125. Let's stand together and honor the reading of God's written word. If you look in your Bible, you will probably most likely have the note uh, that this is a song of ascents, uh, climbing. Uh, if you know anything about uh, uh, Jerusalem, it's about the same elevation as Asheville, North Carolina. So literally when they would go to worship, they would go up the mountain to worship. So let those thoughts guide you as we hear these words of Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people both now and forevermore. The scepter of the wicked will not remain over the land allotted to the righteous, for then the righteous might use their hands to do evil. Lord, do good to those who are good, to those who are upright in heart, but those who turn to crooked ways... The Lord will banish with the evildoers. Peace be on Israel. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we begin our worship this day, once again we know that we are gathering with our brothers and sisters in faith in this church, but also that we are gathering literally with those around the world as we focus our thoughts, our minds, our hearts upon you. And Lord, this day as we come into your presence for this time of worship, we pray that you would help us in these moments to uh, have our focus clearly upon you, that the concerns of daily life would take a secondary place, that we might truly worship you. And Lord, we thank you that as we focus upon you, we know that we do so in accordance with your will for our life, and we pray that you would continue working out your perfect will for each of our lives. For this is our prayer this day, made in and through the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us as his followers to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. Please remain standing. There's a version of Blessed Be the Name that is in our hymnal, but it's not the tune that I really wanted us to do. So we are going to still sing the words, but you're going to hear different music. And while I was listening to the scripture, uh, I felt the, uh, the spirit call on me. And I know that shakes up some of our sound people up there when I want to do something a little different. But uh, when the time comes, I'm going to want us to sing just one verse because it he talked about Mount Zion, 
in Psalm 125. When the time comes, accompanists, I'd like you to leave, blessed be the name, and turn in your hymnals to 555, which is we're marching to Zion. That's what I thought about when he was uh, going through that psalm, and I thought <laughs> some of you out there might be saying, why aren't we singing that? You know what? Well, we're going to, but we're going to do this first. We're going to sing the first two verses of Blessed Be the Name, and then pause while uh, Anthony uh, wipes the perspiration from his forehead. And if he can't find it, and he can't, we will all turn in our hymnals to 555 and sing verse 1 and 4. All right? And I'll tell you when we get done singing Blessed Be the Name. Let's have fun while we're singing, okay? As we sing verses 1 and 2 of Blessed Be the Name. singing on the moment like that. We'd like to invite our children to come down for our children's moments. And they were already on their way. Come on down. Good morning, good morning. It looks like I think this is all of us this morning. All right. How are y'all doing today? 
Good. I am glad. I want to talk to you about something that is probably one of the most wonderful things that God has given you. What do you think it might be? Your family. That's good. Both of y'all said that at the same time. Your brother and sister? Huh? What do you think? Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Okay. What about this? Your mouth. Think about that for a moment. It really is very important to have a mouth, isn't it? How would you get the food in your body if you didn't have a mouth? Mm, be kind of hard. You can do it. Doctors, doctors can do it, but uh, it would not be much fun, would it? How can you enjoy talking with your friends? You need your mouth, don't you? How can you sing? You like to sing? Yeah, I think most folks like to sing. You don't have to be singing in a choir, but you might like to sing along with the music that you hear, maybe on the radio or something like that. But our mouths are something that's very, very important to us, and it is indeed a wonderful gift from God. In fact, I think that it's important for us to think about that because Jesus talked about how our mouth can be something that is a source of blessing. Think about how you can say nice things to your friends, how people can, uh, how you can uh, uh, offer a blessing, so to speak, when you talk to the, your friends and offer words of encouragement to maybe somebody who's feeling bad. It's uh, certainly something that's wonderful, and you couldn't do that without your mouth, could you? I would say pray, but it's really pray out loud because we can always pray without talking out loud. God hears our hearts. But Jesus said that, there's also the other part of the mouth it can be used for wonderful blessing, but it can also do some bad things too, can it? We can say things that hurt people. We can say things that aren't good at all. And so we need to not only thank God for giving us the gift of our mouths, but we also need to ask God to help us to use it in a positive way so that we are blessing and helping instead of tearing anybody else down and hurting them. Uh, because that's the way Jesus would want us to live, isn't it? Jesus said words that were kind and uplifting and helpful uh, to those who were particularly in need. In fact, in our Bible story today, he helped a man who couldn't even talk. He helped him learn, helped him uh, through a miracle to be able to talk so that he could praise God. And Jesus uh, was always concerned to do what was best for those that he was around. And when we are like that, we're having the heart of God. So let's take a moment and thank God for the wonderful gift that he gives us. Lord, we thank you so much for each of these children. We thank you for their inquisitive minds we thank you for their spirit we pray that you would help them as they grow and learn more about you each day in jesus name amen thank you so much and if you go with children's worship there's candy you can put in your mouths as well we come now to a time of sharing our prayer needs and there may be some outspokens among us. We'd like folks to pray for us, but we really don't want to share what it is that is on our hearts. So if you'd like us to pray for you, just lift up your hand. We'll look around. We'll try to remember a raised hand or two, and we will lift you up when we go to prayer in just a few moments. Uh, Brother Dar Suggs uh, has been diagnosed with lung cancer and uh, had, a, had a good visit with him, but I could, I could tell this weighed heavy on his heart. Uh, Miss Dixie Larimore, I know she was awaiting a follow-up with the doctor, but I don't know if she has uh, received anything concrete yet in the way of an appointment. Uh, if somebody knows, how about letting us know at the office, okay? Uh, Kyle Green had his foot amputated this past Thursday. So be in prayer for him. It's quite an adjustment. Uh, remember Phil Ray, this is Amanda Britt's brother-in-law, he has been diagnosed with COVID. Uh, Travis Britt, this is Miss Kay Honeycutt's nephew, has to deal with uh, kidney stones. And uh, Danny Williamson uh, also has uh, kidney stone issues and had surgery on the second. Uh, brother Edwin Stevens, this is Brother Ken's brother-in-law. Uh, he's supposed to be going home, but I haven't heard yet if he has actually been discharged from hospital in Wilmington. 
Uh, Edith Langston, her surgery went okay. This is uh, Mr. Doug's youngest sister. Uh, Jeanette Williamson is home with oxygen. Uh, there may be others, and I encourage you to share openly with other people uh, matters of prayer that you know, you'd like people to be in prayer for. Isn't it wonderful that we have a Heavenly Father that wants us to call out names and situations and pray for one another? The Scriptures tell us to do that. Let us do as the Scripture tells us and go to our Father in prayer. Most gracious Lord, we are humbled by all the many things you can do and overwhelmed by all the blessings you bestow upon us. Lord, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of the needs that have been shared aloud and the needs that are hidden within the hearts of those who are not only here in this sanctuary, but also watching from another forum. Read these hearts, O Lord. Take these requests that we lay at your feet. Bring them unto yourself. Lord, we would like for you to answer them the way we would like for them to be answered, but sometimes it doesn't turn out that way. In those times, Lord, instead of facing disappointment, give us strength or peace or understanding, but help us to walk in your footsteps, along your path, and be in your will. Lord, we ask your continued blessings upon this service and upon us who worship here. Strengthen your servant as he comes soon and shares the spoken message and the servant who gives us an instrumental message. These things we ask in your name. Amen. We are so grateful for the cheerful givers out there. You give of your tithes and offerings. You're faithful about it. You use the various mediums out there. You, you may bring it to church. You may send it through the mail. You may drop it off here at the office or as we come in. But we pray that God will use these tithes and offerings that you give, not just the dollars and cents, but the other ways that we give back to God for all that he gives us. We thank you for that. And we ask your continued giving as we serve a God who gives so much more. Our offertory hymn is a simple chorus, Open Our Eyes, Lord. It's 383, but the words will be on the screen. Would you stand as we sing this simple chorus together?
and they're helping me out again as I'm still trying to cope and, and uh, deal with things. I, I'm going to try to get back to, to singing again, and before some of you go, oh, brother, uh, I am working on it. I am working on it, and I appreciate your prayers. But this morning, I'm, I'm pleased to have Dr. Sharon, who's going to play something very special on the piano. It is a chorus that we have sung before many times in the past. And I've learned that sometimes, you know, David was talking with the children about how important the mouth is in sharing. It's also good for us to remember that we can be blessed without using our voices at all by music that comes through our fingers or our feet or even when we ring a bell or play an instrument and no sung word is occurring at all. So get a blessing as Dr. Sharon plays a wonderful rendition of the song Majesty. She's not in here, but we do want to thank Dr. Edwards uh, for the uh, wonderful rendition this morning. Has adds so much to our worship. Our scripture text for today is from Mark's Gospel. Mark chapter 7, verses 31 through 37. Mark 7, 
31 through 37. Once again, let's stand in honor of the reading of God's written word. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee, into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue, and he looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha which means be opened. At this the man's ears were open. His tongue was loosened and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. May the Lord bless these words to our hearts and lives today. Thank you so much. You may be seated. An elderly man stopped at the hearing aid center and asked about the prices. Uh, the salesman said, well, we have them from $25,000 on down to a dollar and a half. Well, what's the $25,000 um, uh, model like? He said, well, it translates three languages and is the latest in electronics. Well, what about the one for $1.50? Well, this is simply a button attached to a string, the salesman said, pushing it across the counter. Well, how does it work, asked the customer. It doesn't, but if you put a button in your ear and a string down into your pocket, you'll be surprised how loud people talk whenever they're talking to you. <laughs> Two older men were talking, and one of them was bragging just a little bit. He said, well, I purchased the most expensive hearing aid ever made. It's imported, it's guaranteed for life. And the second man said, what kind is it? And immediately the man looked at his watch and said, 15 past two. Certainly it's too easy to laugh at hearing loss and some of those things that come with those effects of aging. Uh, but it's something that probably will affect us all in some degree sooner or later. In fact, experts uh, say that uh, uh, my generation, after years of listening to loud rock music and leaf blowers and all kinds of no noise pollution in general, will result in millions of us having hearing loss. And according to a, a fairly recent study, the National Institute of Health, there's been a 26% increase in those suffering permanent hearing loss between the ages of 35 and 60, some 15 years earlier than earlier generations. Certainly hearing loss is quite widespread and it is a nuisance. But there's nothing funny about deafness. The world of non-hearing people uh, is a world that is filled with loneliness and it is a difficult world in which to live. In fact, the saddest instances of deafness that I know of is the, uh, is the deafness that came upon Beethoven. For a musician, particularly deafness was a tragedy of tragedies. In fact, he wrote about it himself on one occasion. He said, how sad is my lot. I must avoid all things that are dear to me. And this was, there was a terrible time when he was struggling to uh, still conduct an orchestra and play one of his own compositions. And of course, he couldn't hear even a full orchestra as he stood in front of them. And soon, he was uh, leading music to one time and the orchestra was playing to another. And the performance ultimately just disintegrated into disaster. And there's also a, a pathetic image of him after he had given a, a piano recital where he was just uh, exhausted and bent over the keyboard absolutely distraught even though the crowd was standing and offering a thunderous ovation behind him but he wrote on another occasion for two years I've avoided almost all social gatherings because it's impossible for me to say that I'm deaf if I belong to any other profession, it would be easier, but in my profession, it is a frightful state. And Beethoven died, a broken and bitter man. You and I who have our hearing and our vision are able to get around with a minimum of impediments. 
we really ought to thank God every day, and we also ought to salute those uh, who overcome obstacles daily that most of us could never even imagine. Did you I came across something that really surprised me that the three most popular languages in the United States currently are English, Spanish, and American Sign Language. There are far more non-hearing people in our land than most of us who hear might imagine. It's clear that Jesus' primary mission was not that of healing the sick and the disabled. He spent an enormous part of his ministry doing just that, but that was not his primary mission. His primary mission, as he said on many occasions, was to announce the coming of God's kingdom to the world and to form a new community, the church, that would be the vehicle to allow God's coming kingdom uh, to be ushered into this world. Yet still, Jesus was a man filled with deep compassion. People brought their disabled friends and family members to him for healing. And of course, he would not turn them away. And in Mark's passage that we read just a moment ago, some people brought a man to Jesus who was deaf and that he could hardly talk. And they begged Jesus to put his hand on the man and bring healing to his body. But Jesus responded to their request finally. But he took the man aside, away from the crowd. And that's easy for us to miss that. Jesus never intended to make a spectacle out of anyone or particularly his healing ministry unlike the so-called faith healers who put them up on the center stage and brighten the lights when they start to do perform a, a, a healing uh, Jesus didn't do it that way he took the man aside put his fingers in the man's ears and then he uh, Mark tells us that he spit and touched the man's tongue and he looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh he said be opened and at that request, the man's ears were open, and his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. And then it's interesting that Jesus uh, commanded the man and his friends not to say anything about that. Don't tell anybody at all about this miracle, because he knew from past experience that his word got around, uh, that uh, that was going to be all he was going to have time to do, is, is to be overwhelmed by those who had physical needs, because the needs were great. And of course, Jesus did not come to build health clinics. He came to establish the church. But it was his compassion for others that was so great uh, that he could not turn aside those who came to him who had such distress and so much need. And so he asked those who brought the non-hearing man not to tell anyone. It was a simple instruction, don't tell anybody what happened here. But Mark says the more that he asked them to be quiet, they only talked louder and they only talked more. He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. There are three elements I think we need to, think, uh, to see in this lesson this morning. Christ's compassion, Christ's competence, and then Christ's commission. But we begin with his compassion as we sort of already have. Christ could not turn, any way, turn anyone away who was in need. Whether they were physically disabled, mentally disabled, spiritually disabled, Christ simply could not turn his back and walk away. His sense of compassion uh, was tuned in to those that were needy around him. And that's wonderful for us because that means that he still has compassion for you and for me. And after all, there will be times when we will be in distress find ourselves in a situation uh, and it is comforting to know that God has time for us through his son Jesus Christ Christ will not turn away Christ will listen Christ will come to our aid I came across a silly story uh, from uh, a number of years ago uh, I'll take time to share this morning at the end of their first day the young man takes his favorite uh, girl home and emboldened by the night, he decides to try for that first important first kiss. 
And with an air of confidence as they were standing there on the porch by the door, uh, he leans his hand against the wall and smilingly says to his girl, Darling, how about a good night kiss? And horrified, she replies, Are you mad? My parents will see us. Come on, he says, who's going to see us at this hour? No, please, can you imagine if we get caught? Oh, come on, he says, there's nobody around, they're all asleep. No way, she says, it's just too risky. Please, please, I like you so much. No, 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 I like you too, but I just can't here on the front porch. Yes, you can, please. No, I can't, please. And then out of the blue, the porch light comes on. The girl's sister shows up in pajamas, her hair disheveled. In a sleepy voice, the sister says, Dad says, go ahead and give him a kiss, or I can do it, or if need be, he'll come down and kiss him. Whatever you do, tell him to take his hand off the intercom system for crying out loud. <laughs> there comes a time when all of us will push hard on God's intercom button. And if not on our, on our behalf, certainly on behalf of someone that we love. And in that moment, we can be thankful that we saw and experienced the unlimited compassion in our Savior, Jesus Christ. For there will come a time when we all have to rely upon the compassion of Jesus Christ. But beyond his compassion, we see his competence. Not only did he, was he moved that people were in need, he had the power and the ability to help them. He was competent to meet the needs that were there. And I don't know about you, but I have very little difficulty with Jesus' stories and his healing power. Uh, some cynics read these stories and question them, but I really don't have any trouble with that. Uh, just even in my own ministry, I've run across several folks who uh, the doctors gave a, uh, an awful diagnosis to, uh, uh, saying, in effect, you really don't have any hope for living a very long time. Uh, and even as they were uh, pronounced almost dead, things happened and people continued to persist and ultimately they did not die. I know that in our mind and in our emotions, uh, that has a tremendous effect on our bodies and how our bodies respond. And so people of faith oftentimes uh, are able to live longer than the diagnoses that they get. And that certainly would not uh, be out of the ordinary if we imagine Jesus of Nazareth coming in and touching us physically or calling us by name. Uh, uh, Kent, it's easy to imagine that we might respond in a positive way. It's kind of like Dr. Albert Schweitzer uh, once said. He said, every patient carries his own doctor inside him. They come to us not knowing the truth, but uh, we are at our best as physicians when we give that doctor inside each patient a chance to work. And that's what Christ did. He made it possible uh, for the healing to occur in the lives of those that came before him. Rachel Riemann wrote a book uh, titled Kitchen Table Wisdom, and she's a medical doctor. She's learned through the years of her practice that sometimes the best healing for the human body uh, takes place when the mind and the body and the spirit are all working together. One of the earliest pioneers, the mind-body uh, field of health studies. Dr. Riemann understands the importance of faith in her field of medicine because her first and most important teacher was her grandfather, who was a Jewish rabbi. Dr. Riemann speaks on what she refers to as the soul or the life force, very similar to what Dr. Schweitzer was talking about with faith. And she tells a story to illustrate about Max, a 63-year-old man who was sent to her because he had metastatic colon cancer. In the words of Dr. Riemann, she said the experts had given him daunting statistics and only offered him a guarded prognosis. And their work together had to do with helping Max to see uh, himself as he was. Max, you see, had an interesting life story. He had been born prematurely uh, back in the days before uh, premature uh, medicine was as good as it is now. Uh, and that because of uh, his needs when he was young, uh, it took up a great deal of time from his mother uh, and, and her energy and just the first few years of his life. And for some reason, uh, all the extra care that he needed 
enraged his father. In fact, as a little boy, Mark, uh, Max said he overheard an argument between his parents and he heard his father, father clearly say, if that little runt was one of my animals, I'd have put it out to starve immediately. That comment was devastating for Max. The next 60 years, he lived carrying the scars of those words. He lived a self-destructive life that would ultimately probably destroy a weaker person. Dr. Raymond, upon hearing the story of Max, said that despite the many brushes with death, broken bones, and accidents that uh, he had uh, from the, risky, uh, the risks that he took almost on a daily basis, she asked him, he says, well, what do you think brought you through to this point uh, with all the difficulties that you've had? And he said, luck. And she shot him a skeptical look and he said, nobody's that lucky. And he sat there for a moment with his thoughts and then he choked out almost inaudibly, I always wanted to live. She could barely hear him. He said, say that louder. He said it in a little louder whisper. I wanted to live. I feel ashamed, but I want to live. And Dr. Raymond said her heart went out to him immediately. And in a shaky voice, he went on to say again, something inside of me wants to live. And she said, well, say it louder so that I can hear it clearly. Say that to me. And finally, he did. He said it out loud. I want to live. And that went against his lifelong pattern of despising himself and being ashamed of who he was. And with that effort, he raised his eyes and his voice choked it out, no longer inaudible, but he said it with some sense of authority. Dr. Riemann said they stared at each other for a few moments. He did not drop his eyes. He was not ashamed. And she said to him, Max, I want you to live too. And he did for eight more years. Can you imagine a conversation that Dr. Riemann could have such an effect on a person? Now multiply that with someone who had contact with Jesus of Nazareth. What could Jesus do for that person? What could Jesus do for us? Jesus' words of healing are certainly the least controversial part of his ministry. Of course, he healed then and he continues to heal now. And he heals many different things. Sometimes he heals bodies, but he can heal marriages, he can heal broken hearts, he can heal any kind of need because he is compassionate and completely competent, even though he does not always heal just the way we want. But if we let him, he will heal us in the way that is in accord with God's plan. But finally, we can't hear this story, read this episode in Jesus' life, not just simply to see his compassion and his competence, but also to see that as his followers, he commissions us to a ministry of being compassionate as well. That's why there are so many hospitals worldwide attacked with names of uh, churches and Christian organization attached. That's why there are so many Christian homes for children who have been abandoned or abused all across our country and throughout our world. That's why there are so many Christian relief agencies because we understand that we are called to continue and to extend Christ's ministry of compassion. It's just something that goes hand in hand with following Jesus, caring for the people who have needs around us. You know, during the Renaissance, the Benedictine monks were the first group to really identify with deaf people because they had so many of them taken vows of silence. They understood that they uh, had to create different ways to, cr to communicate with each other without using their voices. And so they learned how to communicate without human speech. And of course, this was during a time in, when the church in general and society uh, was prejudiced against deaf people, routinely barring them from coming to the church and being members and receiving communion. Why? Because they could not confess aloud their faith. 
you can't talk, you can't confess aloud your faith. But the Benedictine monks, however, found a way around that. In fact, they developed a sign language. And it was Pedro Ponce de Leon, a Spanish Benedictine monk, that became the first teacher of deaf people. Because he so identified with the deaf people uh, that he wanted to help them be able to communicate with everyone around them. And because of God's grace, through the work of those monks, Millions of people now have, uh, have the ability uh, to communicate with one another uh, rather than being looked upon as being less than human. One small example of Christ's compassion being lived out by one of his faithful followers. And I wonder who Christ is calling us as a church today to reach out to in the same way as the Benedictine monks reached out to the deaf. I don't know that clearly at this point, but I do know this, that if we follow a compassionate Christ who never turned anyone away, he healed everyone who came to him with help, he calls us today in our ministry to do at least the best that we can to help the least and the lost, whoever they may be, wherever they may be, whatever their difficulties may be. Not because we're wonderful, but because Christ is compassionate and he is competent and he commissions us to walk in his footsteps as well. Let's stand for a moment of prayer. As we do, we'd ask that our musicians would come. Heavenly Father, again, we are grateful this day that as we encounter your deep compassion through your son, Jesus Christ, as he reached out to a man who was struggling so much in this life. Lord, as we see what he did, it is a picture of your divine love reaching out through him. And Lord, we pray that you would help each one of us as we seek to respond to your call upon our lives to be people who are moved by your compassion to reach out and help those around us in and through the name of Jesus Christ. For it's in his name that we offer this prayer. Amen. These next moments as we stand and as we sing our closing hymn, Open My Eyes That I May See, we'd encourage you to use this as your time to respond to the voice of God. I'll be at the front to help anyone who has need of making any type of public commitment to join the church or uh, rededicate their life or maybe even make a first-time profession of faith. I'll be at the front to help you in any way that I can. And of course, uh, any time that you would like to uh, contact me, you can do so through the week. Uh, we don't have to do it all right here uh, in the sanctuary at the end of worship. Uh, if you need time to reflect and would like to think about it and call and talk at another time, I'm always available and would be delighted to talk with you at any time about anything that we can do to help. But you use these next moments to respond to the voice of God as he speaks to your heart this day. First two verses of M381, open my eyes that I can see. <laughs>
We're so glad you chose to worship with us this day. We trust that you will uh, not rush off and not spend a moment enjoying the fellowship of those that you have worshiped beside. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we are grateful for the opportunity of worship this day as we have been comforted and challenged by uh, hearing your words and singing as well as offering our prayers together. And now as we go to our places of responsibility, we pray that we would do so uh, fueled by the note wisdom that we are your people seeking to be your witnesses in places where you have put us. Help us, O Lord, to be faithful. In the name of Christ, amen. Thank you so much and go in peace.